Paul. Welcome to Diecast 300. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Seven years, 300 diecasts. Of course, you and I have only been doing this for, I think, I think we've been, we've done like half of these or something. Uh, maybe, in like two years, maybe? No, we haven't done, uh, looking at the archives now, no, we haven't done 150. In fact, two episodes ago was your 100th episode, Paul. We started at number 198. Oh, that's right. 198. So we have been doing this together uh, about a third of the episodes. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So everyone sent in for, for Diecast 300. We had people send in questions. So now we have 300 questions to... Oh, wait. No, it's, it's only 11. <laughs> Here we go. This is going to be a nine-hour Diecast. All right. Well, let's not mess around since 11 is a lot of questions. Dear Diecast, sometimes when I'm done playing a game that I really liked and had a particularly good time with it, it can result in a situation where I don't want to replay it ever again in fear of my memories being better than reality. Has this ever happened to you? If so, why? Regards, Dalek. Oh, wait, it's Derek. Not a doll. Oh, man. Uh, Spook me there for a minute. Right? Um, so this has never happened to me with a, with a game that I can think of. I know somebody who had that happen to them with The Lion King. They loved the movie and were so moved by it that they don't want to watch it. To, they don't want to wear it out. They want it to always feel fresh and amazing. So, you know, over the decades, they've only watched it like three times. Um... I had it happen with wow. songs, but they're, yeah. I had it happen with songs, but the songs are closely associated with really powerful memories. So I don't want to diminish the memory by listening to the song too much. All right. I, I don't know that I've ever been so emotionally involved in a, in a game that I didn't want to play it again. But I, I can totally imagine that happening. Um but I'm afraid I, I can't give any examples. So I understand where this question is coming from, but I don't think it's happened to me. And I think it's, it's much less likely to happen now. If it was going to happen, it would have happened in the 90s, right? When games were really special. Oh, this is one of the two games I'm going to play this year. And, and now it's like I'm, I'm drowning in games. I'm I just... You know, I've got review codes, free games, <laughs> right. Steam sales, huge backlog. Nothing really feels that special. And, I mean, that's just the downside of being spoiled by, you know, your gaming is re doing really well right now, but the downside is, you know, nothing's precious. Right. Yeah. I, I feel like, uh, like this with some projects that I work on, like uh, if I'm working on a really, um, a really intense poem or uh, a story or something, um, or a piece of music, uh, sometimes I'm playing something and something just comes to me and I play it and it's like, oh, I, that was beautiful. I don't want to try to capture it. I don't want to write it down or record it or anything. I just want it to be that perfect thing in my memory. I should claim that's what happens. Every time I like have one of my projects run aground and I just like wander away without finishing it I should just claim no <laughs> it's the feeling you don't understand my emotions it's too powerful I, I can't return to that project whatever it was that code was too perfect for this mortal earth <laughs> right I don't want to I don't want to despoil my beautiful memory by actually looking at my shit code that I wrote dear diecast I really like the fact that you're a video game podcast named after a tabletop RPG whose hosts like getting sidetracked by all number of other topics. So, I'd like to ask, would you like to get sidetracked into talking about sci-fi books? What sci-fi books have you read recently, or not so recently, that have left an impression on you? What did you like or not like about them? Do you think any of their ideas can be adapted to video games? Keep being awesome, Lino. I've always pronounced this name Lino, so thank you 
for the... I mean, it should be obvious. It looks like Dino. Lino, Dino. That's how I'll remember it from now on. But I've, I've called this person Lino many times. Sorry, Lino. <laughs> so, I... I don't read that many books. And it's mostly a matter of... of... I, here's the thing. Everybody reads. You get into bed at night and you read to go to sleep. That does not work on me. If I read, my brain gets super awake. So, <laughs> I cannot fall asleep if I'm reading. Never happens. Um, so, Did I realize... wake up in the morning by reading, huh? <laughs> right. I don't want to read then. And so, there's no good time to read and obviously I'm very busy. So, I mean, I read a book here and there not many. I think the last book I read all the way through was Masters of Doom, which that's nonfiction. The last sci-fi book I read was probably seven years ago, Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. Oh, and, so good. Yeah. Um, that did leave an impression on me. Like, that was my first Werner Vinge novel, and I was like, oh, wow. This person is really big ideas. You know, this isn't just Star Trek. This person has big ideas about how the universe and thought works. <laughs> so big. Um, so that left a huge impression on me. And the thing I didn't like about it is the main bulk of the book took place in this sort of medieval society that I didn't care about. Like, that was the meat of the book. But the outer space stuff, I was really into that. And the other thing about the book that really got me is it's a doorstopper. I don't know how many pages it is, but, you know, you get cramped. If you read that in print form, you know, and you only hold it in one hand, that hand will be more muscular than the other by the time you get to the end. It's just a huge <laughs> yeah. book. Yeah, it's like 320 pages or something crazy. Oh, it's a beast. I mean, you know, it's good. You, it's, it's, not, it's not huge in the sense that they were just padding it out to make the book seem... This was, it was packed with ideas. Vervinge wasn't just wasting my time. There, there was a lot of ideas. He had a lot of ideas he wanted to put in his book, and he did. But, wow. It, it was a big book. For me. Yeah. I, I think I had the same, uh, the same hesitation when I was reading it as well. Loved it. Really enjoyed it. It was one of the first... I don't know if it was the first or one of the first Werner Vinge books I read, but I went on to read almost all his other work. And, um, but reading uh, um, the Fire Upon the Deep... I would get to the chapters about the medieval society or whatever, and I wouldn't skip them, but I would just kind of skim them. You know, it was like, okay, this isn't the part I'm interested in. I want to, you know, see if anything interesting happens, but uh, I'm not here for the, the six-legged dogs. Same. 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 Oh, I just realized uh, while you were while you were while you were saying that, I realized I read like five or six Terry Pratchett books since then. So I, apparently I lied. I read books more than I claim to, but you well, know Terry when Pratchett you ask, what's... is interesting because he's kind of like a cross between sci-fi and fantasy, right? Right, right. Like, where do you draw the line? Uh, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know um, when it comes to Terry Pratchett. But I did read those. I did read a bunch of those books. But yeah, the last book that really, really like made me think when I walked away from it was Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. I think the uh, most recent sci-fi book that I've read was your book, A uh, Different Kind of Life. Cool, I guess. <laughs> it left an impression on me. I don't know if, if any of them could be adapted to video games, though. Right. Like, it's the job of a novelist to make a setting that is challenging at least challenges them and hopefully the audience as well and it seems like anything that is is that close to the edge of understanding is not going to be easy to systematize right like good luck adapting anything with fire upon the deep for video games it would just be a nightmare the the scope would be huge the budget would have to be i mean you know, where main characters are six-legged dogs that are these hive minds that fall apart and come back together. You know, 
like even describing them to the player what's going on you there's no other way to do it but stop and explain it using lots and lots of words you know you can't like you said you can't systematize it and oh my goodness there's so many big ideas the game would be mostly codex entries it would be like mass effect <laughs> if it was like 90 percent codex like, entries yeah yeah, or it would be like uh, Star Citizen, where it's just like, we're still working on it, we're adding all these things, <laughs> all the things you right. wanted. Right. Oh, man. And even, even like, another kind of life would be difficult to adapt, because it's about an art of, like, a real convincing artificial intelligence. It's like, well, we don't have those yet, so, like, you can't put one in a game, because they don't exist. Right. And even, to, like... Even turning them into movies, which is closer than, like, turning them into games would be harder. D maybe you could turn other kind of life into a movie. It would lose a lot, but, you know, you could tell the story of, like, solving this crime. But I can't even imagine how you would turn Fire Upon the Deep into a movie. It would kind of be like Doom. Like, it just the, the fans of the book would just sit there in the audience shaking their head the whole time going, No, no, wrong. Wrong. <laughs> or, or it would have a budget of a hundred million dollars and and be directed by Michael Bay or something. Oh, oh, please, God, no! Right, and it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be the story. It would just use the story as an excuse to have fights between people you don't care about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or I guess you could go, like, high concept and, and really dig into it, like The Lord of the Rings or something, but it would just be such a production. Right. They are adapting Terry Pratchett, though. Um, like, a book at a time. The, they have The Color of Magic, and uh, Hogfather's been adapted. Really? I think, yeah. They, they, uh, where are they coming out? I... Think the BBC is making them? I'm not totally sure. Huh. A uh, lot of. I I know my wife has watched Hogfather like half a dozen times, and Color of Magic also. Like the the bad guy in that, the lead wizard is played by Tim Curry, who just <laughs> chews up the Perfect. chews up the scenery. Yeah. Oh, and. Uh, the the tourist. What's the tourist's name in Color of Magic? Two Feather. Two Feather is played by oh I'm blanking on his name, but the guy that played Sam Gamgee in the Lord of the Rings movies, he plays Two oh, Feather. Yeah, I can't remember his name either. Oh, okay. I just looked it up. It's Sean Astin. Every time I thought of it, I was thinking, I know it's Sean. Sean Bean. No, wait, that's Boromir. So what is it? Is it Sean? Is it Sean Bean? No, it's not Sean Bean. Brain, stop saying <laughs> Sean Bean. It's Sean Astin. Sean Astin. Oh, there's a current picture of him. Oh, my goodness. He's getting old. Oh. Oh, you're Why right. Why does this happen to everybody? This, this means I'm getting old. This is terrible. <laughs> okay, so I I think that uh, turning a book into a movie, like you said, is probably easier than turning a movie or turning a book into a game or a movie into a game, either way. And right. there are some kinds of books that when I read them, I feel like they were written so that they could become bestsellers and then be turned into a movie. I can't think of any books I've read recently that feel like they were written so that they could become bestsellers and then turned into a game that were sci-fis, but uh, Shadow of the Conqueror by Shad M. Brooks does feel like it's more of a fantasy, but it does feel like it was written to be turned into a game. It was very, it was a very interesting experience. I went the other way. I turned uh, a video game into a book, my very first book, Free Radical went yes. the way and yeah that seems much more doable than going the other way and turning a book into a game yeah like, yeah like, well like Dwarf all, Fortress you, that happens all the time you're playing Dwarf right. Fortress and you're like oh I want to make I want to write this story down and turn it into a, a an expression that is more accessible than playing this game and it seems like that it isn't just that different mediums have different lend themselves to different topics and subject matter and scope. It's that 
it seems to be that it's easier to go towards books. And, it, you know, in, in progressing difficult, okay, books, you can make almost anything into a book easier than you can make something into a movie, which is easier than making something into a game. Like, the, the, level of, the levels of stuff you need. Like, movies need visuals and books don't need that. And then games need visuals and gameplay that m movies don't need. Right. Yeah. So, sorry, Lino. Uh, I'm afraid it goes the other way. Hi, Paul. Hi, Seamus. Is there a game or series or genre where the trial and error approach to gameplay situations is frequently present, but that's not frustrating to you, but the opposite? It's fun and you enjoy the game. Also, happy this is Sparta Diecast. Congratulations. Best regards, Deadly Dark. So... Times when you don't mind trial and error, Paul. Uh, I feel like the, um, what is it, Zachtronics games are like that, where it's like, I don't know exactly how this works. I'm going to try something and and see what happens, and and that's fun, and it it works because the turnaround for feedback is very very short, and I don't have to erase any of my work to get back to fiddling with things. Yeah, trial and error works really well in puzzles. Like, that's how you want to solve a lot of puzzles. Is trial and error. Let's see what this does. In fact, that's like exploring the puzzle is how you solve it. You learn the rules of it. Especially especially if you're in a game that's not all about puzzles. So, like, you're, you're running through the enemy base, stabbing them or shooting them or whatever you do in this game. And then you come to a room and there's no bad guys, but... Oh, there's shafts of light that come through here, and some mirrors around the room. And there's a door over there with a the big glowy thing on it. Oh, all right, I guess I'll move this mirror. Oh, I see, and that bounces off of there. And you, you know, you solve the puzzle by shoving things around the room or breaking something or whatever. Like, that's, that's fun. <laughs> like, that's trial and error, and that's super fun. But it's interesting about that trial and error is that when you fail, you don't reset the entire... Po it's not like failure in combat where, oops, I didn't beat the boss and now I've got to start over at the beginning. Trial and error within a puzzle is just, well, I've got to keep trying. And so I don't know if that actually qualifies as trial and error in the sense of being sort of defeated repeatedly, like in a game where you, you know, you die a lot. It seems like it must qualify. I was thinking of The Witness as kind of a, a primary example because there are no instructions. It's just trial and error. Right. Oh, yeah. That's one, that's one that's has to be trial and error. If it isn't trial and error, it's too easy. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't mind Hotline Miami. That's got a lot of trial and error. Probably the kind Deadly Dark is talking about where you die a lot. You know, oops, I ran in the door and that guy shot me. Okay, I'll throw something. Oh, wait, no, the dog got me. Okay, but the, okay, I'll sh slam the door open, back up, wait for him to come through, shoot it, then hit him with the door, then throw my empty gun at him. All right, now I got it. Like, that trial and error, I find fun, but, you know, the retry cost is very low. Yeah, you respawn quick, and the level doesn't change, so you get to practice on the same thing over and over so that you can master it. Right. What, uh, trial and error can be less fun in stealth games. Like, oh, there's one way through this room and you've got to figure it out. And Oops, I got caught. Reload. Oops, I got caught. Reload. Oops, I got caught. Reload. It's, you know, people will complain about how frustrating it is and people will say, it's not that hard. You just got to know what to do. And it's like, the point is that it's breaking your immer- like, Oh boy, I've got to sneak through. You feel all this tension, but you know, once you get caught four times, you, you all the tension is gone. The in-story tension has evaporated, and it's just you versus this purely mechanical challenge. And I don't know how to fix that either. Yeah, then it's the the tension of frustration that that you're trying to fight. Right, like the thief games are so perfect at 
the Thief games have this tightrope thing they do where if you're immersed, if you haven't been caught yet, those games are just able to create absolute maximum tension. Like, super, like, <gasps> okay, there's a guy down there. I, I thought this room was empty, but there's a guy patrolling down there. Okay, I'll just hide in this. Oh, oh no, he's coming this way. He's coming this way. Okay, I'm going to... Push back against the wall is how you just keep holding the S key as if that'll let me press against the wall and <laughs> suck in my gut a little more. And oh, please don't come this way. Please don't come this way. <gasps> he's stopping. Oh, ah, okay. He's turning around. He's leaving. Oh, no, there's a guy on the other side. I've got, I've, I've, he's definitely going to catch me. I need to, as fast as possible and yet as slowly as possible, slink over to this other shadow without getting caught. Those are some absolute terrifying moments of just maximum tension, and they're great if you get through them. If you get caught and you have to reload, then the magic isn't really there the second time, right? Like, you're just... Because you're like, oh, I you have to watch out for that guy, and I know the guy, the guy's in the other room, and... And now it's just a, a challenge. It's like going through a, a maze with a pen. It's like, well, okay, so I have to, like, print out a new maze every time. It's... Why? Right, and I don't know how you'd fix that. I mean, that's just... It can create wonderful tension, but if you get caught... I suppose if you get caught and instead of reloading, you run away, lose them, then that feels sort of um, like you're continuing with the experience, but you lose them and they're still kind of on high alert. That feels cool. Like, okay, I got caught, and I'm paying a price for it. Now everybody's all worked up, and they've turned on some extra lights or whatever happens in this particular game. That's fine. But just reloading until you can, like, grope your way through a stealth challenge takes away the emotional. You've still got the mechanical challenge is good, but the, the immersive emotional challenge of, like, <gasps> I almost got caught, and... and you know, getting some adrenaline because, you know, you're in a lot of danger. That is spoiled the moment you either die or get caught or have to reload. And there's, there, I don't think it's, there's a way to solve that. It might be a problem with, uh, with play style too. I don't know about you, but for me, this reminded me of playing Receiver 2, where if a drone spots you, what you're supposed to do is run away and get out of there and then wait for it to calm down and then you go back and you know inch your way forward but i always just stand my ground and shoot at it and like that's a bad choice but it, i don't have a, an opportunity there's no training and there's no opportunity to try again if that doesn't work because you're dead and you have to restart and the whole thing resets and it generates a new level and stuff and so it it, it doesn't um it doesn't train the player very well because there's such a long reset time and and also it's partially my fault because like i know i should run away but i just don't and and like that's i, I don't like to and so i don't and like it's you know it's uh, that's on me interesting i didn't even know running away was a was an option in that game in the previous game i don't think it really was i think they would just chase you forever no yeah they, if they lose sight of you and and don't don't spot you at least in receiver two, uh, they'll go to where they saw you last and just kind of hang around there. So it's it's actually not hard to lose them. It's just I I don't try. Huh. So puzzle games is the answer to that one, Deadly Dark. Yeah, puzzle games. Hello, Seamus and Paul. This question is as much for your readers as for you. I picked up Borderlands 3 when it was finally released on Steam. I've been really enjoying the game, but I have been curious about my experience. Six months and two DLCs later, have you gone back and see if the experience was the same for you? I haven't been experiencing what you did, which kind of had me on the fence before playing it, and I was wondering if your experience with the bullet sponges and power weapon power have changed. Also, I enjoy your dissection of previous games, and I wonder what your opinion of the overall plot and tone of 3 were. Recently, reading re reading your earlier posts, I think some of the unanswered questions from the earlier games, i.e., Zarpadon and Blowing Up the Moon, were answered. How were you? How would you rate or compare this? And is there ever a chance we might get a series of articles on it? Anyway, thanks for your website. In these times, it is even more enjoyable than ever. Chris, thank you, Chris. 
Okay, to answer the last question first, there is definitely a chance that I'll write a series. If I come back to the game, I will probably use that time to write, to just continue the Borderlands series from where I left off. I have not been back. I feel nothing for the game. I don't feel any attachment to the characters. And in fact, the more time I spend away, you know, normally you get some nostalgia, like, you know, boy, I didn't really care about Grunt when I was playing through Mass Effect 2, but looking back, I kind of like the, I kind of like that adolescent idiot. <laughs> I kind of liked his, his goofiness. Uh, I could stand to hang around with him. Like, you get fond memories or you realize good things when you are away from a game for a while. I feel none of that for Borderlands. In fact, every time I think back to it, I just think of how irritating everybody was. Yeah, like the bad guys were were irritating, and I don't mean like because they were bad guys. They were just obnoxious characters that weren't nearly as funny as they thought they were. Um, tonally, they were all over the place. the The writer had two different ideas. I'll do something with streaming culture, and I'll do something with cults. And they didn't really fit together, and they didn't try to make them fit together, and it didn't make a lot of sense, and the jokes did absolutely not... The only jokes that landed were the ones that it just reused from Borderlands 2. So I am, in a narrative sense, completely uninterested in the story. I thought it was dumb and boring, and did a bunch of dumb references rather than... Well, I mean, it was written by someone different, and you could absolutely tell. This is someone new trying to imitate the style of someone else, trying to imitate Anthony Birch. And you could tell that, you know, they were like, well, Anthony Birch did this, so I'll do this. But, you know, it isn't quite the same. It's not as funny. It's not the right time to do that. That sort of thing. So you're just the whole time watching somebody imitate somebody else's style. So, narratively, I don't care about the game, other than just finding it really irritating. And I remember the gameplay poor. I just remembered bullet sponges and just never feeling powerful, no matter how many guns I got. I never had the... There was no um, ebb and flow to the gunplay. It wasn't like, oh, my guns are really weak, and then you find an awesome gun, and then you feel really powerful, but then a few letters levels later you feel weak it's just homogenous it's just it's just you always feel a little bit underpowered so yeah not a lot of reason to come back to it maybe i'll try again if i do we'll get a series out of it but in the immediate future no i can't imagine that happening especially have since... they rebalanced in the meantime or has isaac been i playing? wonder uh, Isaac came back to it, like, a couple months after, you know, we both, like, played hardcore for uh, a few weeks, both got sick of it at the same time, both came to the same conclusions about, oh, I don't care about these characters, the jokes don't land, and the gameplay is super monotonous. But then he went back after a couple months, and he walked away with the exact same impressions. Like, yeah, it's it still sucks. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know, but you know, there have been, like he said, like uh, Chris said, two DLCs since then. Um, I have, don't have either of them. Maybe some major rebalancing has been done. I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious. If they added stronger guns to the game but made them really rare, then maybe I'll be interested in playing the game for that chance. You know, add another tier since you've turned orange tier weapons which used to be you know this wonderful thing to get and now they're just trash that you throw away or sell <laughs> like throw in the ground i'm not even going to sell this why would i it's like oh i'm carrying around so many gold bars and they're so heavy i'll just throw them on the ground who cares and they're worthless <laughs> if they if they add another tier of weapon like uh if they bring back the pearlescent from borderlands 2 and if those will actually do something to bad guys when you shoot them with it then then maybe i'll be able to come back to the game and enjoy it although buy two dlcs to make the game decent doesn't sound like a good sales pitch no it doesn't although they might just in the i mean a very common thing is there's a sort of 
system-wide rebalancing patch to make allowances for what the DLC does. Oh, so, okay, yeah. you know, kind of like in City Skylines, where every time a DLC comes out, a few things from the DLC end up being free, just because keeping two entirely different sets of mechanics going would be a huge pain in the ass. Right, so, right. So, like, when Sunset Harbor made it so your subways can come above ground, that that was just a patch for even if you didn't buy Sunset Harbor, you could bring your subways above ground for, if you wanted. Oh, man, just like we had in SimCity 2000. Right. Although now they're just trains. Now they're just really sleek-looking trains, but whatever. Okay. Dear Diecast, you guys seem to have vaguely complementary skill sets. Why don't you make a game together? The podcast could just be about game development. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Follow-up question. If you don't want to do that, can you recommend any good game development blo podcasts slash blogs? Congrats on the 300, Chris. So, why don't we make a game together, Paul? Well, Chris, it turns out that uh, making a video game is a fool's errand. Only idiots and uh, and over abundantly hey. uh, endowed uh, fools will at even attempt the matter. It's uh, one does not simply walk into game development. Okay, I'm feeling personally called out here, but everything you said <laughs> is true. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not it's not a good investment. I guess okay. So I would I would love to do a a Kickstarter with you, Seamus, and like, and see if there's a market for something, and you know, raise some money and make a video game. But just like deciding to make a video game on a lark, like man, neither of us have the time for that. Right, right. My time is really spoken for. And if I was gonna do a game, like I'm really irritated by the need to earn money. To fund the game like can we just start the project and if it you know we'll just start making it and then somehow money will happen so that we can live and I don't want to like charge money like when I think about all the ways you could make money I don't like any of them okay I don't want to Kickstarter and then be one of those failed Kickstarters but I don't want to charge money for a game I'm not gonna finish well, and I kind of don't want to run another Patreon because that doesn't, again, people fund your development and everything. And then, so all the ways I can think of that make money don't seem very attractive. I just want to somehow have money happen. And I would like what my dream would be just open source it, just work on it, you know, <laughs> every week push, push your new stuff to a public repo, but you know, then push a, actually packaged together form of the game for the 99% of your audience that aren't programmers. Like, that would be well, the there's dream. your answer, Chris. Seamus doesn't know how to make money, and uh, I don't know how to... My problem is I don't know how to control scope. I'm just like, if you, yes. you want to see <laughs> scope completely out of control, you can read my blog, Project Fledgling. That's projectfledgling.com. And uh, it's just it's just bananas. It's totally, it's totally nutso. There's no, there's no horizon upon which to, to fix one's gaze. It's just like the elemental plane of Earth. Solid game ideas forever. <laughs> right? Right. You don't finish Paul's project. You merely work on it until you are unable to continue working on it. There is no end. Yeah. It's uh, it's sad, but that's where we are. I, on a on a more optimistic note, I am holding back any uh, any beginnings of projects and stuff until Jai comes out because I don't think I want to start writing a a computer game in anything other than Jai because I think Jai is amazing. I also want to try Jai when it comes out, although I'm very fond of Unity. Like I would probably do more Unity. If, if it wasn't so hard to get the documentation, to just get this simple knowledge. Oh wait, I I just want, I just want to insert something in my shader path to do something simple. 
I mean, really, <sighs> it's a, it's one checkbox, and you know, fill in a field somewhere. But I have no idea where that checkbox and that field are. How do I find them? <laughs> and you'll right. and you'll spend four hours on it, you know, just slamming your head into it, looking on forums, and you won't really find it. But you'll find a way to do it that you know is a terrible hack and is wrong. And then later you're, you know, working on something completely unrelated, and you'll stumble on the answer for that in, you know, a stack overflow. And it's like, why is this not in the documentation? Now I know how to do it right. Do I go back to what I did two weeks ago and delete it all and do it properly? Because it's working now. So that's the problem of Unity. But boy, if, uh. if I already knew how to use Unity, I'd be perfectly happy there. Dear Diecast, in the last Diecast you mentioned, as an aside, that tower defense games have sort of vanished, despite having been very popular for a while. This got me thinking of other genres of games that have, if not died, then faded into a shadow of their former selves. Point and click adventure games, real time strategy games, and now tower defense. So my question is, what genres do you think are on their way out, and are there any where you'd, where you'd hope that they'd vanish? Is there anything you think is due for a renaissance, like how rogues and roguelikes have reappeared? Thanks for the great content. Go stu. True story. I said tower defense games have vanished. This week on Steam, they had a sale on tower defense games. No kidding. So I felt a fool, and then I looked through them, and I'm like, I've heard of most of these, and I've sort of discarded them as, uh, like someone said in the comments last week, Tower Defense hasn't really vanished, it's just gone to mobiles, and they've morphed into mobile games, and that's not very interesting, just by the nature of the interface, like it's, oh, instead of just letting you put your towers anywhere, and you have lots and lots of freedom, it, there's a lot of constraints because of the interface. You know, you don't have a precise pointing device. You have the giant fat end of your waggly human finger that you're trying to <laughs> click on this, on this, you know, what, 10 inch screen on? It's not even 10 inches. Like, what's the size of a cell phone screen? Like I don't six know, inches. Five maybe. inches. Yeah, something like that. Like, you just cannot click on things precisely. So instead of, putting down, you know, formulating a strategy for your towers. It's like, here are four slots where you can put a tower. Click on it and then select the thing to put there. And it's very shallow. And none of them looked very interesting. And you know what? They all looked great. Like, if I was sitting in the doctor's office and wanted to kill 10 minutes, this would be great. But if I want to sit down for half an hour or 40 minutes and, like, enjoy a couple of rounds of tower defense... None of these games would do it. The the so that that's a funny aside that tower defense games are still around, but they've morphed into this thing that I don't like anymore. <laughs> uh, to answer the question, a genre that's on its way way out. I don't want to hope any genre would vanish. I mean, assuming if it exists, then someone out there is is being made happy by it. Like, I don't like Call of Duty, but I wouldn't, you know, if I had the Infinity Gauntlet on, I wouldn't snap my fingers and make Call of Duty stop existing because there are millions of people out there that really like playing that game, even though I'm not one of them. Like, that would be an asshole move. So right, I don't wish right. any, anything would vanish. Um, but if I had to guess it's something that is on the way out, it looks like the Battle Royale... Uh, thing the fad is pit is passing like we had PUBG, we had fortnite and then everybody put a battle royale mode into the this year's latest shooter and now i think everybody's burning out on it and i don't i don't think that's going to continue i think we've we've seen the last of them everybody because it's this basically is more a like fad. a a mini non-structured tournament right Right. And we've already had tournaments, like, for a long time, but they're structured and, and, you know, there's vetting and stuff, so you can't just, like, have 
cheaters win every time or whatever. And uh, PUBG is just kind of and an well in the whole that whole genre of of uh, that kind of thing. I forget the name now. You just said it. Battle Royale. Ah, uh, I never watched the movie. That's the problem. It's called a battle um, royale with cheese because of the metric system. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it seems like it seems like it's just kind of the worst of both a tournament where only one person really gets to win and uh, free for all and randos jumping in and spoiling your fun. John Green uh, of the Vlog Brothers was playing Fortnite for a long or PUBG. I can't remember which one. And he talked about how he was playing the game as a pacifist. And uh, that sounded hilarious to me. He was apparently streaming, but I never tuned into the streams. Like, that sounds like a really, really boring stream to watch until he gets near the end. Like, it's not interesting. Like, you just, the beginning of every PUBG match or any Battle Royale is mostly this slow, but okay, everybody has to get some weapons and get going. And it doesn't get interesting until the last, like, 10 minutes or whatever. I forget the scale that these games operate on. But it's like the last, you know, the very last few minutes of the round suddenly get really, really interesting for the audience. But. There, there's a long buildup, and if you're watching a streamer, then they're probably getting booted out of the game early. Just statistically, you know, most people don't make it to the end. So, right, the streaming experience is, you know, he parachutes in, dies right away. Find another game, parachute in, live for three minutes, die. And, you know, you could do that for hours before you get a good game to watch. So I've never watched it, but I love the idea of trying to pacifist your way. You'll never get past second place. But if you could somehow be, be in second place as a total pacifist, just by, you know, sort of nonchalantly sneaking into the center of the conflict and never drawing attention to yourself. Yeah. It's a fun idea. I, I played that way a, a lot when I was playing PUBG, and it, it does get you to second place pretty consistently. Now, you never, like you said, you never get to first place, but um, you get decent gear and, you know, you sneak around and you avoid conflicts. And uh, yeah, it, it's not it's not particularly hard. It's just, like you said, not particularly interesting either. <laughs> right. I mean, one, if if somebody were to take sort of a highlight reel, you could make a fantastic hi highlight reel of close calls and near misses and funny situations like someone's about to kill you but then someone else randomly kills them and just runs by without noticing you and you realize they just saved your life and didn't know it like moments right. like that would be fantastic for a highlight reel and you could you could make one really good highlight reel out of you know a couple weeks worth of games um, if there's a genre I hope would vanish, it's the always online single player with loot boxes. And luckily, seems like that's on its way out. Right? Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I can, I can wish that would go away. This is sort of a renegade interrupt for me. Yeah, I could wish that would go away because I know the people playing that are only playing that because they can't get what they really want, which is that without the loot boxes. <laughs> so if if uh, if you get rid of that bullshit and just go back to the old days, those people would be happier too. Dear Diecast, have you been following Andrew Huang's Four Producers One Sample? series on YouTube. The summaries where they go over the sample manipulation and music composition techniques they use seems right up Seamus's alley. I know you've mentioned Huang's YouTube channel and music lessons before. Do you think participating in something like this might, sounds like it might be fun? Maybe if it was with a bunch of peers of a similar skill level? Regards, Kow. K-O-W-H. I don't know how to pronounce that properly. I'm sure I just messed it up. Um... I'm sure somebody will give me a better idea of how to pronounce it in the comments. So, yeah, I, I am absolutely not 
not, not able to participate in like something at Andrew Huang's level. I'm still very amateur and it's been a few years. So I think I've, I think I've plateaued. I think this is as much music composer as I have in me, which is a shame. <laughs> it's slightly embarrassing, but this is what I've got. I don't even know if I would uh, if I would feel comfortable participating in a for okay, okay the, the premise of this is you start with a song or a sample or just like a breakdown some sort of sound musical sound in nature and you give it to four of these top tier music producers and they each go and they turn that into their own song. And it usually, you know, it's in a different key, different tempo, different genre. It's just whatever they feel. You know, they listen to the sample. My favorite one is where they took an existing song, but then they just took her lyrics and chopped them up like crazy and made something completely different out of it. I mean, it even had a different time. Like, I think the original song was in 5-4 and, you know, they all put it in 4-4. So... You know, really chopped up and changed. And that's a very high skill level of thing to make a really good song out of an existing, completely different song. I would never be able to do that. And, you know, I can barely just using my tools make something worth listening to. So making something worth listening to under those constraints is definitely too much for me. But I love the idea of it. And I just, I, I have been watching this series, although. YouTube hasn't suggested it to me in a while, and I have this I have this suspicion that YouTube um, I missed a couple and YouTube decided I didn't want to watch it anymore despite my subscription. YouTube's been doing that a lot lately. It's pissing me off. Hmm. Paul, do you have anything to say on this sort of since you actually have, you know, musical ability and skill and you've been doing this for much longer than me do you have anything to say on this topic i i haven't been following andrew huang's uh thing i i don't um tend to make music by sampling it's just not like i i'm a, a trained pianist and and like i improv on the piano and i i sing and so like it's a very different or it feels like a different workflow as opposed to like taking an existing thing and kind of like rearranging it um it sounds fun i personally i would like to to participate in a project to write a procedural music generating program that will like generate music on the fly of an arbitrary length i think that would be really fun um you know i i often think about that when i when i look at the rather sad state of my own work like, I'm like, oh, this is kind of catchy. It's not so bad. And then I come back to it a week later and I'm like, this is hot garbage. I'm very glad I didn't <laughs> post this. Like, it's really tedious. Like, okay, that, that, that moment right there, you know, is kind of neat. But then the rest of it's so repetitive and it's just so uninteresting. And, oh, it's, it just seems so flat and boring. And I've never been able to break out of that. So... The question of how to I could I procedurally generate even that even boring music since I know how to make boring music I could probably make a procedurally generated boring music generator, but how could you make right. it good? I don't know if I knew that then I know how to make better music and this the sad truth is I I pretty much have shelved all my music project as much as I love doing it um, and it's not because I'm terrible it's just because I don't have time for it. My uh, my guitar is right here. It's within arm's reach, and it has a layer of dust on it. And I enjoy playing it, but I mean Aww. playing in, in exaggerated air quotes. You know, I just strum chords and try and, you know, jump from one chord to another without sounding obviously awkward. That's my practice. But, you know, I am so busy now with video production like okay music earns no money it's the first thing to get the cut it's the first thing to get the axe just i have no time for music now not even on days off um sometimes i strum a little on days off um and fool around with music but n not much 
Not much. It's rare. Mostly days off is like family, because that's another thing that that I don't have a lot of time for during the work week. Yeah. Dear Diecast, I've written a four-paragraph book to you, asking you a question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut out the the most of it, and uh, you can read the whole thing in the show notes if you like. Here is the part I'm gonna read. How far can you go with altering historical events in a video game? Should there be limits for players' interactivity in the name of historical accuracy? Or the other way around, should events always be determined by their choices? Regards, Derek. So this is an interest this question focused a lot on Assassin's Creed, whichever Assassin's Creed um, focused on the French Revolution. And you know, there apparently you as a player are able to make choices that didn't happen in real that are ahistorical. Like definitely you are you are doing the opposite of what happened in history. And the game will roll on fine with that. Um, I don't know that there's this question is like sort of what should you do in general? If you've got a one off game, then do whatever you want. Yeah, let the player change history, do whatever, who cares? If your game is supposed to be visiting many historical events, like Assassin's Creed Unity, I I don't think that's a great way to go about it. Um, the The idea of, well, you know, I can assassinate George Washington, and then, you know, or... You, you know, make it so that the American Revolution didn't happen or or whatever or it happened at a different time. But then, you know, when you go to make the next game, what what are you doing? It's like, what well, you've changed too much history. <laughs> like you can't what's the next game gonna even be about? Or you're sort of signaling to the player, either do what happened in history or the game's the next game in the series is gonna ignore it. I think if you're gonna be visiting historical events the the assassin's creed system is really stupid they keep using famous historical people and then making you buddies with them and then and then you're like why is my character not more important to history or whatever <laughs> right well and and on top of that like the whole conceit of the assassin's creed series is that you're not actually doing these things. You're just reliving this right. thing that already happened, and you have to stay in sync with it of what really happened, or you'll die. Like you, you'll get kicked out of the simulation. And so, like in in that conceit, in that world, in that system that they've set up, that they've told you this is how it works, you have to do what actually happened in history, or it makes no damn sense. <laughs> right. And if. Because of the because of the premise of the setting, and because you can do more interesting storytelling things, what they should you know it makes more dramatic sense. Make up a cast of characters that we care about, and make them bit players in the overarching drama. Don't make us friends with you know an incredibly famous person. Make us maybe be in the same room with them at the same time. You know? Right, right. Play the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern characters. Yes! Yeah, exactly. And, you know, but fill them out and give them personalities and make us care about them. But, of course, you know, last time I checked, nobody within 100 miles of Ubisoft knew how to do that. Or at least not in the Assassin's Creed team. Yeah, like, it's kind of a weird, this, kind of a weird thing. Oh, yeah, when you start talking about the narrative of Assassin's Creed, it is such a train wreck. It, we, we talked earlier about Borderlands felt like it's being adapted by somebody who, you know, isn't the original writer. Every Assassin's Creed game feels like a new person who's who's trying to interpret the previous person's work. <laughs> and it's just like, is this constant groping for, like, what is our game even about besides stabbing people? <laughs> <laughs> like recursive fractal death of the author. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's such a beautiful way to put it. Like everybody's like, oh, Black Flag was so good. What well, was good? Oh, the ship com combat was really good. Like when people like an Assassin's Creed game, it's always because it did something interesting mechanically. 
I've never heard anybody praise the meta story or the character. Oh man, it was so great being friends with Leonardo da Vinci and then like showing him up in every conversation and showing how much smarter we were than him. Oh, <laughs> so like not I, I just wrong role playing a douchebag, just like I am in real life. <laughs> It's so immersive. Oh boy. Okay, so, so, so yeah. stepping back from Assassin's Creed, like historical games in general, um, if it's a simulation game, then it feels like it's totally on the table to to like go off the rails. Like uh, all those World War II simulator games where you can be Germany and take over the world or whatever. Like, fine. Like, you know, you're, you're playing with the systems, you're playing with the, the setting, you're playing with, you know, how would things have gone, like, kind of alternate history kind of things. Yeah. And that's that's a great way to do it in video games, is just alternate history it. The problem gets when you want to crank out infinite sequels, but also continue the story from the previous game. It's like, well, wait, now you have contradictory goals. You want to keep launching from fixed historical events, but you're allowing changes that would make those events not take place. So, yeah. It, it sort of depends on the structure and what you're trying to do. And again, it gets way easier if you're not committed to infinite sequels. If you want to make one game, then you can do whatever you want. Or, or if every game stands alone, do whatever you want. Let the player change history. Experiment with stuff. Do things differently. It's great. Like, you're, you're not bound by history at all. Unless you're trying to do infinite sequels <laughs> that are all connected. Yeah, if you want to maintain the same narrative, then... Well, and it runs into the same problem as maintaining the same narrative in a narrative-heavy, choice-heavy game, like the Mass Effect series, where you start compounding these choices, and pretty soon the game is just like... You can only have one or two choices because there's such breadth in the background that the players have been able to set up. Right. Oh, you let this play person live... And, and then, did you marry them? And then, did you have a kid with them? And then, and this is pretty soon, you've got this infinitely branching possibility space to take into your... None of that's important. Like, none of that's actually possible in Mass Effect. But, like, if you did give the player the infinite choices they keep asking for, yeah, it would just get out of hand so quickly. I kind of like the, the approach of you make it... You visit the planet of the week, which, of course, the first game is the only one did, that did that, and make a decision that vastly impacts that planet. And then you go out into the wide galaxy, you're not going back to that planet again. So we don't have to carry that decision. We can carry that as knowledge. Somebody could refer to it later. Oh, you did this thing. But we don't have to, like, remove characters and have replacement characters on the ship and do all kinds of crazy things and and carry and right. let them fractally break apart in the future. We can just let them stay inside of their bubble on the planet of the week. It's like the first game had the perfect structure and then they threw it away and then they made it worse. <laughs> yeah, you, you just more do choices the Star Trek thing. Less... You just if anyone needs to die, he's a red shirt. And, uh, you know, you keep this core cast and they just visit these things and you can string that on as long as you want. Right. Oh, we're talking about Mass Effect again. Okay, everybody, drink. Oh, no. Dear Diecast, one of my earliest memories is the first time I ever played a video game at a neighbor's house. That's funny. That's one of my first memories. Although, for me, it was Pong. Let's see how much younger this person is. The cheerful music... Colorful visuals, an apparent miracle of the input feedback loop by which I was able to control the little blue hedgehog made me an instant convert to gaming for life. Okay, so you are quite a bit younger than me. Skipping to the end. Uh, now, this is filled with a lot of things about, you know, how uh, games have impacted them and, and things like that. But the wrapping up, you know, to get to the kernel of it, do games matter? Can gaming be meaningful? Have others found an intrinsic value in playing games, or are their potential benefits considered to be more limited and utilitarian? Congratulations on reaching 300 episodes. ASD, ASD. Thank you for the question, Fahugwa gods. <laughs> um, so games matter. I mean, I think I'm going to come down really hard on yes. I mean, I have to. 
for me, yeah. I mean, games have... Games, that is the thing I've consumed most out of all entertainment media. More than movies, more than books. Like, I'm here for the games. And yeah, I absolutely believe they have value. They have value as much as any of those other entertainment mediums. I'm not sure what the, the last sentence is asking, because it seems to be drawing a line between uh, intrinsic value and utilitarian value. And, like... Maybe that distinction means something to someone else, but for me, like I'm, I'm a pretty practical guy. I'm an engineer. Uh, I, I like things to have a purpose. I like tools. I like knowing how to use them. And for me, games are tools to better understand uh, myself and the world. So, like, yeah, they're they're really valuable. I don't know if that value is intrinsic or not, but to me, it doesn't matter. What matters is the extrinsic value. What you get out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 usefulness to me. It's, you know, where can I grab this thing and what can I hit with it and what problems can I solve when I do that? I'm, I'm hoping you keep this particular experimental pro approach limited to video games. You don't just arrive <laughs> at work, somebody's bought a new thing, you're like, what is this? And can I hit people with it? And then the boss has to call <laughs> you into his office again. Paul, we've talked about the hitting before. We're tired what, what of having meeting? Where can I grab it? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, just if entertainment has value for human existence, then games have value. Like, I'm really come down hard on that, on that opinion. I don't see any reason to, like, ask, oh, is gaming as important as other forms of art? Like, for me, the, the question answers itself. There's no question. It's and at for least me, as important it's, as the it's others. It's a, a question of, is, is, uh, is learning important? Because for me, the, the main value of games is being able to learn new things without putting yourself in the peril that would otherwise normally associate with those things. You can learn how to fight drones with un unreliable guns without having to get shot 50 times by drones. That's useful exactly. knowledge. Well, and, you know, like, breaking up with someone, like, you don't want to do that a lot, but you can practice it in a game and, and go through the emotional impact of it. It's not quite the same as watching a movie, about, you know, a rom-com or something, or, you know, a sad story, a, a drama or something like that. Like, you can get some of that experience through that, but doing it yourself and making those choices yourself and feeling the impact of those choices yourself is, I, I think it is much more valuable as a a autodidactic tool than almost any other form of not even entertainment but just like any other form of engaging with the world hmm i hadn't even thought of it on that level yeah like yeah just sort of exploring the systems of the world in small isolated chunks so you don't have to engage with the whole in the high stakes version right yeah dear diecast I'm skipping the beginning of this question as well. Uh, the question is, nowadays I do a bunch of note-taking, even though ever more information is easily accessible online and there is less need for me to do so. How about you guys? Do you write down notes while playing? I imagine Seamus jots down a lot for articles on the site. Val, Tim. So I actually don't... It's, it's somewhat of a joke in my office here that... I can't, you can't write anything down. People will be talking, oh, we should write this down. And like, okay, where's paper? Do you have a pen? And I do, there are like paper and pens in this office of mine, but nobody can remember where they are when you need them. Like everybody goes out to Heather's desk where it's just covered in pens and scraps of paper that have things, little doodles drawn on them. Cause that's where you go to write things down physically. I don't keep physical notes. Um, back in the 90s, I took a lot of physical notes. You know, drew, I drew in Eye of the Beholder, which I think was a 1988 game. I made a full map of every level in the dang game. And that was a huge amount of work. Like, I spent more time making those maps than I've spent making, playing through entire games in the modern world. <laughs> but, yeah, as... For, like, remembering things later, I don't write things down. I alt-tab in Google Docs. 
On the other hand, when Heather and I were playing through Return of the Obra Dinn together, she, the first thing she does is she grabs pencil and paper and begins taking notes. And I'm like, honey, they've got a, a screen right here that takes all the notes for you. <laughs> <clears throat> she's like, no, no, I need to have it in, in the front game. of you. Right, and she's like, no, I, I need to have it here. And she writes, and I often can't understand her notes, but they work for her. She'll be like, yeah, that's that guy that did this thing over there. See, it's related to this person. And I'm like, is that what that diagram said? Okay, I trust you. <laughs> So, yeah, I am not a very, I mean, this goes back to my, per I've never been a note taker, never. Like, in school, taking notes for me was antithetical to learning. If I'm writing something down, then I stop listening to the lecture, I, I, which drove me crazy. Like, that really hindered my learning is when they would, like, fault me for not writing everything down and I'm like if I just listen I can remember it stop making me write things down then I'll remember less of it you're annoying me so yeah I don't write things down except to type them into a Google Doc I write down all kinds of things not usually when I'm playing video games but uh, right now at this instant I have a, a clipboard with a whole stack of paper on it with all kinds of notes and on top of that clipboard is a lined notepad with a whole bunch of notes on it and then behind me is a whole drawing board that's just like littered with papers all with drawings and notes and all kinds of stuff on it and then next to that is a stack of papers of notes and things and then under that stack of papers under the desk is a backpack and in the backpack are a whole bunch of like sheafs of, of papers and stuff with notes all written on them and underneath the drawing board is a stack of printer paper just like three or four reams of printer paper just sitting there waiting for if i ever run out of paper so uh i yeah i use paper and pencil all the time for all kinds of stuff i keep uh, one by my bed and write down dreams make notes for my dream journal um i've got one in my backpack and just in case i got an idea i want to sketch it out or write it down or something it um really helps me to think about ideas to to get them out of my brain and onto the page and and spatially i'm very visual and spatial uh and so it, it helps me to, to kind of lay things out and and uh be able to it unclutters my mind to to get it down on paper that's very interesting that's a lot like heather and very unlike me yeah i remember i remember things people say like those are the longest lasting memories for me it's not things written down but things that i hear so that's very mm. interesting Okay, well, here we are at the last die-cast question of Mailbag 300. The 300th Hi, Seamus question! And Paul. The, the 300th, we finally reached the end of the three... You, you probably fell asleep in the middle of this die-cast, but fear not, my friends. It is the same day and the same hour. Hi, Seamus and Paul. I've been watching a YouTube channel that I think you guys would find interesting. It's called Let's Game It Out. Most videos focus on one of the myriad of low-budget tycoon or simulator-style games out there, playing them in the most absurd way possible. He finds hilarious ways to exploit broken mechanics and push systems past their breaking point. Here's an example of Link. Uh, he's playing smartphone tycoon, designs terrible phones, and sells them at ridiculous prices, and somehow sells enough to sell 34 quadrillion phones by the end of the game. He's done a whole series of videos on Satisfactory, the first of which is here, there's another Link, and they get progressively more ambitious at physics breaking as they go. Hope you enjoy them. Daniel. All right, that's not a question. But I appreciate the link. I watched the first episode of that Satisfactory, and it was pretty funny. It, uh, you know what your base looked like at the end, Paul, where your satis your end game base was this horrific nightmare of overlapping conveyors covering this massive area. Yeah, that's what his base looked like when he was just making iron ingots. <laughs> right. Like he was yeah, he's, he was still in the he's first intentionally tier. making a mess. Right. And it was kind of fun to watch. It did make me want to skip skip ahead and see what sort of nightmare he made in the end. Uh but I didn't get that far in it cuz you know, videos are time consuming. But yeah, it's a charming channel. Reminded me I, a bit of the spiffing Brit, the playing games wrong and breaking them. The spiffing yes. Brit had yeah, had a lot of that in his series. 
I, I've uh, also come to both of those channels independently, and uh, I I enjoyed this Piffing Brit for mostly just for being cheerful and and sarcastically complimentary to his audience. I, I'm not sure if that's a I don't know. I, I don't know if that's falling for flattery or what, but it it's kind of a, a fun thing to just be like so blatantly pandering to the audience. And uh Right. And then and then he does have he, you know, he highlights a few ways to exploit games. It's like, okay, that's cool. You know, he's having a good time and, and pointing out how the systems are broken. And it also is fun to think about systems and and see, okay, you know, there's that corner case or that weird thing or the loophole. And how would you close that without breaking the rest of the game? And how would you how would you fix this, right? And uh, right. his his movies are slow enough and uh, and shallow enough that it gives you time to think while he's prattling on about T and his wonderful audience and stuff. So of the two, I prefer the Spiffing Brit. I don't watch either of them regularly, but um, for me, it was it was kind of frustrating to watch the Let's Game It Out videos uh, because. Well, obviously, I I don't mind things being messy. It feels um, it feels wrong for it to be messy on purpose. Like my base is messy because I'm <laughs> yeah. doing things as pragmatically and as quickly as possible, and I'm not caring about it making a mess. But he's not doing things pragmatically at all. He's just trying to make a mess. And it's like, well, it's I, I don't really. I, I'm there for the efficiency. And if the efficiency is messy, uh, fine. Yeah. But he's like not there for the efficiency or for the beauty. It's just like gratuitous uh, chaos. And I don't know. It, maybe that's it's fun for some people. It's not fun for me. So I I have not uh, gotten hooked on the the Let's Game It Out videos. Although I did watch the the linked one about the smartphones and and it seems like it's just kind of a, a game that's not a very good game to begin with and he's like oh look i can do all these crazy things in this game it's like okay well i don't know what that says about satisfactory uh maybe it's not a very good game to begin with either but it's uh i don't know it's it's a different style for perhaps a different audience and uh it didn't it didn't land with me it reminded me the the crazy nonsensical base Reminded me a bit of obfusc obfuscated sea contest, which I'm willing to bet is still oh, a thing yeah. that exists. Um, although at some point you you see some of the entries, obfuscated sea is just ingenious. But then you see an entry and you're like, okay, I have no idea what this program does. It's just random symbols. Technically, this is valid C code, but I can't even begin to get even. Just reading the code slowly and carefully, I cannot imagine what this does. That's fully obfuscated. <laughs> it's that's it's it's completely opaque. That that's it. We've reached peak obfuscation. What are we gonna do in the future? So I haven't checked on uh, the obfuscated C contest in about a decade, but I wonder where that I wonder where that whole meta game is at these days. Oh yeah. I remember that came up some years ago on the blog or someone someone was talking about writing a computer program that tells a story in the code or something like that. And I, I think I made one in Python that I mean, it wasn't a good story and it certainly wasn't a good program, but it, it did do both. It was kind of it was a fun challenge. Interesting. Yeah, that's what ga let's game it out. I just watched the one episode. And that's what it felt like to me. Somebody beginning their project of making the most hopeless, hopelessly obfuscated base you could imagine. And that's why I kind of wanted to skip to the end and see, see what he wound up with. Right. Well, Paul, I think we've done a 300th show. Here we are, the end of all things. Yep, this is the end of the internet. So I just want to thank everybody that's watched and read the internet over the past 30 years. You've been a great audience. Um, obviously, this is the last episode of the show, but if you want to send in more questions anyway, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye forever, Paul. Goodbye forever, internet. Goodbye forever, Seamus. Goodbye forever, diecast. Goodbye forever, Paul.
So do we have a post episode joke is or is this like is the joke that there is no joke? The joke is that there is no joke. <laughs>